Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. I'll be interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and others that are involved in following their dreams and helping to make our world a better place. Today on the show, we have uh, Glenn Plaskin. He's a best-selling author and uh, veteran celebrity interviewer specializing in writing in-depth interviews for magazines and newspapers, celebrity memoirs, and self-help and inspirational orientated books. Welcome, Glenn. Thanks for being on the show. Um, like I mentioned in your biography, you have quite the impressive profile. So I just want to, you know, kind of give our audience a little bit more of a background on you and kind of find out, you know, where you grew up and, you know, went to school and that kind of thing. Maybe we'll start there. Thank you for having me today. I have an old joke I always tell, which is uh, you read all that stuff off and I always tell my mom, gee, I did so much with so little, because when I was in grade school growing up in Buffalo, New York, um, the principal brought me in the office one day and told my mom and me that I had a very low IQ and that garbage collectors could be happy too. (laughs) (laughs) And my mother was very upset with me, and I did uh, get bad grades uh, up until around ninth grade because I wasn't really uh, paying attention much and I was in another zone, so to speak. But back in those days, you know, people thought if you tested badly, that meant you, you know, you weren't very intelligent. So um, I remember going to the drugstore and looking at all these magazines about uh, famous people, and I thought to myself, uh, wouldn't that be weird that years later that would be my job, interviewing famous people? And, you know, it's ranged from first ladies, uh, you know, like Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis and Nancy Reagan to movie stars like um, Meryl Streep or Elizabeth Taylor or newsmaking people like Donald Trump or Leona Helmsley or uh, self-help kinds of people like Tony Robbins and Deepak Chopra. And even the corporate um, interviews I've done with like the CEOs of IBM and Pepsi and other companies. So... I find it ironic that uh, a kid like me who was so shy, with very little confidence, who did not perform well academically or athletically, I thought, well, what are you going to do with him? So (laughs) it's just funny that I wound up actually, uh, 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 journalism and book writing became a passport, you might say, to meeting people that I otherwise would never have met. Sure. I kind of feel that same way about the radio show. There's a lot of people that I've gotten to reach out to that I never would have had the opportunity to if it, if it wasn't for the show. So I totally get that. Mm. Yeah, so I always tell people, um, if I could do it, you could do it. Totally. A lot of people are just almost like scared to ask in a lot of ways. That's how I got a lot of the things that I've accomplished. And it sounds like you're kind of in the similar boat, right? Like you just went for it one day, right? Well, you asked me uh, before, you know, how did I get into writing? And that was not my goal or interest in any way. Uh, I uh, had no interest in becoming a writer. During my childhood, I was being um, trained to be a pianist. Really? Interesting. I started when I was eight years old, and by the time I was about 13, I was pretty serious. And by the time I was 15, I decided I want to be a classical pianist concert pianist and by the time I was 17 I was auditioning for conservatories of music and spent nine years uh, going to two different conservatories of music for college so when people say well what background do you have for writing I tell them none (laughs) wow that's that's That's, awesome but, but when I was 25 I realized I made a mistake so you see the decisions you sometimes make when you're a teenager about what you want to do with your life don't necessarily hold later. And by the time I was 25, I realized that I didn't want to do this and that I actually wasn't going to make it as a concert pianist despite my abilities. So what I did is I had an idea for a book just out of the blue about who was at that time the most famous classical pianist in the world named Vladimir Horowitz. And I came to New York with no friends and no money and no experience. And I started calling publishers on my own just telling them I had this idea for a book. And there had never been a book about him. And I got all these people interested, including Jacqueline Kennedy and Nassus, who was a, 
uh, editor at that time at Doubleday Publishers. So then I went to the William Morris Agency, the talent company, and I told them I wanted to write this book, and they said, well, what have you written? I said, nothing. And they said, well, what do you have to show us? I said, nothing, except my list of 14 publishers that were interested. Well, to make a long story short, I was told to go write a book proposal. I didn't even know what a book proposal was, but I somehow went and did it, and when I came back, believe it or not, within six months of moving to New York City, uh, I had sold that book idea um, to a major publisher in the U.S. and to another publisher in England. And for the next three years, I was writing that book. And the first thing I did was call up the New York Times and told them, I'm now writing this book, and I'd like to write an article for you. And they said, well, what, what idea do you have? And I told them the idea. And that was the first article I ever had published. And, wow. And I, all I'm trying to say by telling you this story is that back then when I had so little, I was thinking really big. I thought, well, since you have no experience, you might as well <laughs> try to start at the top. And oddly enough, people were receptive to me, and um, I did hire a writing teacher to teach me how to do it better, and I hired a research assistant, and um, I got the help I needed. And when the book was published, the first book, it was on the front page of the New York Times, the London Times, the L.A. Times, the Chicago Tribune. Wow. It was all over the country. And suddenly I remember being on a book tour, sitting in the Beverly Hills Hotel one day and thinking, gee, how did this happen? You know, uh, a few years earlier, I was a broke piano student who was going to wind up teaching other people how to play the piano. And now I'm on a book tour. That's so I awesome. always tell people that if um, you don't think you can do it, uh, I mean, maybe you can and maybe you can't. But all I'm saying is you, you have to try, you know. Totally. So I'm curious then, did you got kind of an upfront um payment to write the book or were you working full time during that period or or how did you kind of support yourself while you were writing the book because you said it took three years to write that oh uh, I wasn't working at all I was working on the book yes a publisher play, pays what's called an advance okay and so I was living on the advance and it was uh, fairly considerable because the you know the agent had done a good job selling it so yes I was living on the book money and I was writing the book and then uh, when I finished writing the book, by that point, I was broke again. And then uh, I got lucky, which is that my agent found me uh, a niche writing uh, for Playboy magazine. Uh, my first interview was a long format interview with Calvin Klein, the designer. Wow, that's, and um, that, that's impressive. And that began a series of interviews that included um, many you know, celebrities. But the first one was Calvin Klein, and in fact, he after the interview was published, he liked me, and he actually got me my first writing job, which was at W Magazine, wow. uh, a full-time job, and that was like going to college for me, because they sent me all over the country. I was interviewing everyone from first ladies to college, university presidents, uh, doing stories about uh, artists and conductors and painters and politicians. And it was really a good training ground for me. And then slowly, um, I became known for writing celebrity profiles in national magazines. And there were many, you know, it was Carol Burnett and Elizabeth Taylor and Joan Collins and uh, all, all kinds of people. And um, that led eventually to my writing uh, full time for the New York Daily News, uh, where I had my own syndicated column that was syndicated by the Tribune Company, and the column was called Turning Point, um, and it was about how famous people face crisis in their life and what they learned from it and how they overcame it. So every Monday next to Ann Landers, there would be um, a column by me uh, that would have an interview with a famous person about how they overcame a crisis, and um, eventually this became a book called Turning Point, Pivotal Moments in the Lives of America's Celebrities. And Oprah did a show on it, and Joan Rivers did a show on it, and Larry King did, and um, Sally Jesse Raphael, and all these people who at the time had talk shows. And so that was my second book, based uh, on a 120 celebrities that I had interviewed about how they overcame crisis in their life. 
So that gives you a little portrait of what happened to me. So Oprah did an entire show on the concept of Turning Point, and uh, we got uh, four or five people to come on the show, famous people to talk about uh, moments in their lives that affected them deeply. So, um, And each one of those people did a whole show on it. So it was exciting for me, considering how low my IQ was. <laughs> oh. Do you still play the piano or music at all, or are you kind of just completely done with that? Well, it kind of faded away. Um, I was playing for a long time, but much less so. You know, I went from practicing six hours a day to not practicing at all. Sure. Um, and honestly, um, whatever need it was fulfilling during childhood and during my 20s, it must have gone away because I really don't miss it much. Um, but it's still part of me. I find myself sometimes, if I'm in a waiting room somewhere, my fingers start moving. I'll be playing a piece, you know, on a magazine, and there are all these things still uh, going on in my head that I remember. So uh, the physical syntax of, you know, moving your fingers and playing, I guess you could say I'm using my fingers on the keyboard of the computer now. But <laughs> um, getting back to the networking thing, that long before social media, long before LinkedIn and, um, you know, Facebook and Twitter, I was networking unconsciously without really knowing what I was doing, but I was asking for help all along the way. I said to Calvin Klein, I need a job. And he literally picked up the phone and called the CEO of the company and said, I'm sending someone over. You've got to interview him. And I wow. literally went, went over uh, that day. And That's I, got the, I got the job a few days later. Um, or when Calvin Klein said, I said, listen, I want to have an interview with Diana Ross. He picked up the phone and he called her for me. Or he picked up the phone and he called the White House and got me an interview with uh, the then First Lady. Um, and later when I wanted to interview him on television for the Today Show, he did that for me as well, kind of as a favor, because I didn't have much um, experience in television. So, uh, you know, one person can lead to another, and oftentimes people will doubt you. Even when I was hired at the Daily News, they doubted that I could deliver all the celebrities that I said I could. But huh. honestly, I myself wasn't sure I could. I'm never sure I can. But when I was hired, I felt I had to. And so I actually did, whether it was Sylvester Stallone or Meryl Streep or Al Pacino or Robert De Niro or all these different people I went to interview, or Harrison Ford uh, and others I can't remember. I just forced myself to do it. And I had lots of adventures along the way. I spilled my orange juice on Harrison Ford and really? by accident. Yes, I reached out to touch his hand, and I knocked over this carafe of orange juice, all, and it got all over him. But he was a very good sport. And when Elizabeth Taylor came down the staircase to meet me, she was wearing that huge Krupp diamond, and I said to her, is that it? And she said, yeah, would you like to touch it? And she took her ring off and threw it at me, tossed it to me, and I held it. And then I remember saying to her, your skin is just beautiful. And she said, would you like to touch it? So she had me touching her face. And I said, what's your secret? And she said, sesame oil. She put sesame oil on everything. Huh. And there were just these little vignettes that, you know, you remember. Or I remember when I was in Lionel Richie's house, he had recently won an Oscar for one of his um, songs. And I had never held an Oscar. Well, in my scrapbook, I have a great Polaroid picture of me and Lionel Richie with me holding his Oscar. <laughs> That's awesome. That's incredible. So do you keep in touch with a lot of these people? celebrities that you've you know kind of talked to throughout the years especially like yes. Calvin Klein and them oh yes as recently as a few years ago when my book about my dog came out Calvin Klein hosted the book party and Judge Judy was there and uh, really and all these other people that I, I always keep in touch with the people you know that I've interviewed and in fact um, one thing I always tell you know writers is that you're going to need testimonials from other um people about your work so for example if you look at um my website like katiebook.com you'll see there are testimonials from judge judy uh and from mariah carey and donald trump and mary tyler moore and all kinds of people betty white um those are all people that i don't know socially i know them all from 
interviewing them. Right. Okay. No, that's cool. Because, yeah, I've, I've definitely obviously checked out your your sites and whatnot. And I'm sure you guys see each other, like you said, at parties. And it's pretty cool that Calvin Klein threw you a book launch party at his place. That's incredible, right? Um, yes, it was. It was like a dream come true. And uh, I'm always uh, – I'm not really – terribly uh, confident uh even now i'm always really? surprised oh yes i'm surprised i'll say oh wow did i do that uh because to me you know i still feel a little like that kid from buffalo who was standing in the magazine shop um just dreaming one day of meeting somebody like that um so i don't even so anyway that's how i so it is kind of a strange story that, you know, I grew up um, playing the piano and wanted to be a professional musician, which I was, and then I did transfer into writing, which was really, truly accidentally, because after all, a lot of people go to journalism school with the hopes of getting jobs at newspapers and magazines, and I went into news magazines and newspapers with absolutely no training and no credit. No one ever taught me how to interview anybody. Um, I taught myself how to pretty much do it. Sure. Um, so um, I think a lot of it is intuition and instinct, and also a lot of it is preparation. Um, I recently did an interview with the uh, former police commissioner of New York, Ray Kelly, and um, it was an 8,000-word interview. I did weeks of research before. I had entire pages single-spaced on just one topic to cover. Because if you're going to interview someone, you must be prepared. Um, I'd rather have too many questions than not enough. Yeah, because it's easy to cut some out, right? Or schedule a follow-up interview to cover the rest or whatnot. Well, you have to know how to skip from one to the next in the right order. Yeah, Sometimes with um, celebrities, you don't get a second chance. Sure, um, yeah, fair it enough. It has to happen in that one hour or 45 minutes. You get one chance. So you've got to give it your best shot. You know? No, it totally makes sense. So I'm curious, though, you, you mentioned kind of you've been ghost writing and, and stuff like that. How did you really get into that? Like I get, did like just writing for magazines kind of, you know, move into no, that? No, no. Uh-uh. I got into that the same way I got into writing, uh, really by accident. Um, I had no intention of being a ghost writer. After all, everything I was writing was under my byline, right? Sure. So, um I had interviewed um, somebody famous for Family Circle magazine, and before the article came out, I decided to just call him up on the phone and read the final result to him. And he said to me, oh, I'm looking for someone to help me write a book. Are you interested? Hmm. So I said, oh, okay. So he said, send me over your stuff. So I sent over this big pile of interviews uh, to his hotel. And to make a long story short, that was my first ghostwriting job. He flew me to uh, uh, a variety of places to work with him. We, we worked in Australia and Fiji and Vancouver and Palm Springs. And oh, wow. um, we worked together for 15 months. And um, that was the first ghostwriting project I did. And then after that, I did another one, a Christian-based book called The Power to Change Today, which was a self-help inspiration kind of book. And then I realized that that was another aspect of writing that I could do. Um, because whether you have a byline or you don't, the process is more or less the same. When you're ghostwriting, you have to interview the person extensively right, or take and or take printed materials they may already have or their own writings, and you have to somehow synthesize all that material into a narrative that is um, compelling. And I found I could do it. So I created a business. Uh, my website for that is ghostwriteyourbook.com. And it's interesting that um, I did a little research, and 81% of all Americans say they have a book inside them. That's really? That's like 200 million people who aspire you know, to the literary limelight, and yet only a very few people actually complete a book. But now with the advances in social media and self-publishing, which is no longer a vanity process, you can actually write your own book and have it marketed 
and seen on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and you can market it through social media and get it out there uh, in a way that you never could have done 30 years ago. Sure. So uh, there's a whole business now for people who are public speakers or corporate executives who want to use a book, for example, as a marketing tool that broadens their platform. It's like a tangible promotional calling card, you know, that you can just give someone uh, for back-of-the-room sales at conferences, meetings, or speaking engagements. And then other people want to write a book, uh, like some of my clients, to, for their legacy. They may be getting older, and, you know, and they want an accurate record of their life and their experience, something that they can give to their family, friends, and business associates. And then there are other people, like celebrities, who want a book to set the record straight. Sure. Um, no, that makes total sense. So there's a whole bunch of um, options out there. And um, it's just another dimension to writing, and it's something that I found I could do. So that's how I kind of got into it. I seem to get into everything by accident, don't I? So I, I'm curious, though, when you're when you're doing research for people, do you traditionally kind of follow them around for for weeks or months or you know years at a time, or? Do they kind of just send you stuff? Do they try writing some of the book themselves and then want you to kind of just edit it? I'm, I'm a little bit curious about how that whole kind of process works. Or is it kind of different per person? Well, it is different for each situation. Uh, in one case, for example, the person I was working with had a lot of transcripts from his public speaking engagements already. Okay. Literally notebooks of transcripts. And then he would dictate into a tape recorder each chapter idea for me. And so by the time I listened to his dictation and read the notebook, I was able to write a first draft of the chapter on my own. Okay. Then I would travel to him wherever he was. We would sit down uh, in front of the computer and read it out loud and then start changing it, enhancing it, and editing it together. And it would go through four or five or six different versions before one chapter was finished. So it's a time-consuming sure. process. Um, so that took 15 months. Other times, I've written a book in just five months with someone who, for example, would send me his sermons. And based upon the sermons and our book outline, I would again write the chapter out of my own head, and then we would go over it together and he would add into it things that he wanted. And again, it would go through multiple drafts. Um, sometimes for memoirs, I interview someone. I don't have to be with them. I don't have to travel at all. We can do the entire thing on the phone. Hmm. Uh, interviews on the phone that are recorded and transcribed. And then I, those interviews form the basis for the chapters. And again, once I compose the whole chapter, I send it to them. We go over it, we change it, we go back and forth, and eventually it goes through uh, editing and copy editing and until there's hopefully no mistakes in it. And so each one is, is different. Is there usually a publisher involved before you even kind of get started, or you're kind of looking for a publisher throughout the process, or kind of I'm finish not looking it? For a, I'm not looking for a publisher at all. Remember, I'm just... The ghostwriter. Okay, so it's up to the client books. then. I don't publish books. I don't market books. Right. I don't even edit books. Yo, my edit. job. Okay, interesting. Uh, no, my job is to do the writing. Now, with celebrities, sometimes they already have a publisher. Uh, because remember, to sell a book to a commercial publisher, you need what's called a book proposal. Sometimes people hire me to write those first. Okay. But whether or not they have a publisher or they're going to self publish, in the end, you must write the book anyway. Sure. So uh, what I do do is I refer clients to companies who, who specialize in self-publishing. In other words, they take the manuscript and they copy edit it. Then they create a cover for the book. They have, have a design for the interior of the book. They uh, register the book with the Library of Congress. They get it on Amazon and elsewhere. There are companies that do self-publish book marketing. Lots of companies that do it. So if you are someone out there who wants to write a book about anything, it could be about your family history, 
It could be about just about anything. Um, there are companies who can publish it. And on my website, you know, I talk about a couple of different categories. For example, there's the autobiography or memoir. You know, those are books for people who want to capture their life experience. I get lots of letters from people who either have come out of jail or they've gone through drug addiction or terrible uh, tragedy, and they want to write a book about how they uh, survived it. Uh, it's almost like it's cathartic that they want to do it. Then there are people who want to write inspiration. I mean, there's a huge market out there for self-help and inspirational books. Sure. Um, and, you know, that can that's a whole category unto itself. Those two are my specialty, autobiography and inspiration. That's my background. Um, then there are psychology books, you know, books about relationships and recovering from life challenges and uh, getting rid of old habits and feeling happier. That's another specialty of mine. And then there's health and diet and exercise. That I haven't really written as much about, but it's something that I've written in magazines a lot okay. about the mind, the body, and the soul. And, um, and then there are business excellence books. There are a lot of business people out there who want a book summarizing you know, their leaderships, uh, leadership principles and vision. So, um, uh, but no matter what the book, there's a couple things that you always need. You need a narrative that's going to be compelling and interesting to read. You've got to begin with an introduction you know, that will kind of seduce the reader. Um, you need a hook for the whole book that's going to really make people wake up and pay attention. And for a ghostwriter, of course, you have to capture uh, the voice of your subject. Uh, I can't use my voice. I'm trying to use their words, you know. Sure. So you kind of like try to be in their shoes kind of and write as if they were writing it? Yes. Um, you may not even like their style, but if they hire you, you got to use their style, you know, not yours. Sometimes I will admit I uh, I use a blend of them and me, sure. and they seem to like it. But if they don't like it, then you've got to capture, you know, their voice, and you got to paint a picture, you know, that's punchy and emotional, and um, got to keep the action moving and build to the book's climax. Sure. So those are just some general things about ghostwriting that are important. Like, for example, if I'm writing a magazine article, I kind of know how to do it. Uh, if I'm writing a memoir, I shift into that, uh, you know, channel. Um, if I'm writing a blog for my website, I shift into that. When I wrote my own uh, book, it's, co it's called Katie Up and Down the Hall, and it's a true story based upon an article that was published in Family Circle. Uh, that was the most personal and emotional thing I ever did. See, the one thing I never do is write about myself. I never, ever did that. Why is that? Not, well, I I just was always hired to, you know, do interviews with celebrities or to write books about other things, but nobody ever asked me to write about myself, and I never did. But um, for Family Circle, I once wrote an article about the relationship that developed in my life. I live in New York City. Um, in a high-rise building that's right on the Hudson River opposite the New World Trade Center. Okay. And it's very scenic here, and there's thousands of people. And the idea was there was this woman down the hall who was in her 80s. She and her husband had never had children, and I became extremely close to them. They became like grandparents. And then further down the hall, there was a little 3-year-old kid, a boy who didn't have a mom, but he had a dad. Okay. And so this older woman who had never been able to have children, she became like a grandmother to that little boy. Well, I wrote an article about the relationships that can develop in urban places where your family is not necessarily your biological family. Sure, it can interesting. be your surrogate family. And that neighbors can actually become like your family. So I wrote an article about this older woman who was very uh, charming and this little boy his dad, and me and my dog. And the article was so popular that my agent said, well, why don't you turn this into a book? Well, I didn't do it right away. I waited eight years. No sense in rushing, right? Fair enough. And when conditions changed, and I won't say what happened, there came a point where I was ready to tell the whole story. And the story begins uh, around 1988 
and goes up until the present. And the book is about how one dog has the power to turn five neighbors into a family, and it's about what happened over a period of 16 years between this little boy, his dad, the older woman, her husband, and me and my dog. And we go through the adventures of 9-11, and there are losses and deaths and accidents and high points and low points. And it's a very emotional book. And oddly enough, um, it was my most successful book. I say oddly enough because (laughs) everything else I've written was about celebrities, and this is just about me and my dog and our experience. But it seemed to hit a chord in people because, you know, there are millions of dog lovers out there. And um, I produced a uh, book trailer that people can watch on the website. And um, the website's uh, interactive. If you visit it, you can see all kinds of stuff on there. And there's a book trailer that you can watch if people want to. Sure, and I'll post the link in the show notes so people can, uh, you know, go go through it. They don't need to remember it right now. Right. Uh, remember, anything that happens to you in life is, is, is can be subject for uh, something in your professional life. Like, I took what happened to me personally, and it turned it into a book. Sure. That, you know, that was highly meaningful to me, but the book is a product. And actually, it wasn't until that book came out that I learned how to use Twitter and Facebook and stuff like that. Really? Um, up until that point, um, I wasn't using social media. But to promote this book, the publisher insisted that I uh, get on get on target. So I did. So, so did your agent find you kind of a publisher, or did you have to hustle that yourself? No, no. Uh, I don't find a publisher myself. The agent. Okay. Uh, when you have a book idea, after you create your book proposal, in order to sell a book um, to a commercial publisher – you have to have an agent. Publishers will not buy books from individuals. Oh, okay. And so the agent shops the proposal. They send it out to dozens of publishers, and eventually we narrow down to a good one. In this case, it was an excellent one, um, Hachette. Sure. H-A-C-H-E-T-T-E. That's oh. the company that has been in um, lots of legal wrangling with Amazon because uh, – question about royalty payments and stuff but anyway um that's the company that published the katie up and down the hall book do you still keep in touch with the father and the son and oh yes um the father now lives in paris oh wow uh, the boy the three-year-old is now in his early 20s going to college oh wow and, in new york um, or out in arizona okay and um to find out the rest of what happens, you must read the book. All right. Sounds good. No, that's awesome. I don't want to give the um, ending away. Makes but sense. But it's a fun book, and it came out in hardcover, softcover, ebook, audiobook. So, you know, nowadays there are so many options of, for how you can even read or listen to a book. Um, you know, back when I wrote my first book about the musician Horowitz, there was no such thing as an ebook sure. or an audio book. It was just a book book, you know. Do you have any other upcoming books that you want to talk about, or is it still kind of under wraps? I'm working on a couple memoirs for people who are writing stories of their lives, and um, I've also been working on a financial book uh, with someone from the show Shark Tank, ABC oh, wow. TV. Uh, it's kind of a self-help book for people about money, and uh, I hope to write another book of my own uh, about subjects that I'm interested in. So um, I guess the future is an open door, right? How many projects are you typically kind of working on at one time? I get the scale can be quite different, but, you know, is it two or three? Is it more like five or six? Or is it kind of depending on what you're doing? Or do you, like, try to fit magazine articles in between books? Or Well, it's never never five or six. I prefer actually to do one thing at a time. Okay. If I'm writing a book, I actually prefer to just concentrate on that. But recently, for scheduling reasons, I couldn't do that. So over the last six months, for example, I was working on three different things. I was working on a memoir for a producer who works at CNN. I was working on a financial book 
and I was working on a memoir, and I was doing all three things kind of at the same time, shifting gears, you know, between them. Sometimes I'll spend like, you know, a week just focused on one of these things, and then the next week I'll focus solely on another. Okay, so you kind of break it up into weekly chunks then? Sometimes. Okay. Sometimes I'll do two things in a day, but um, I try to just concentrate on one thing at a time. Um, And as far as magazine articles go, um, I don't do that as much, but the most recent ones were a few long-format interviews um, for Playboy magazine. The reason I like Playboy... um, is not uh, because of the photographs. <laughs> it's because they have um, uh, very long interviews. They're like 8,000 words. Oh, wow. And most magazines now are doing much shorter interviews. So you can really do in-depth work. And, you know, everyone from Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy and President Carter and Barbara Streisand and Clint Eastwood and Tom Cruise, everyone has done the Playboy interview. And so it's right. considered prestigious to do it. There isn't hardly anyone you can think of who hasn't done it at one point or another. And so, for example, I did one with Tony Robbins, and you can include the link in on your show if you like. Sure, I will. And that's a particularly um, good one, because after all, he's the highest paid self-help uh, life coach guru in the world. He makes $30 million a year doing it. Oh, wow. And I didn't so, realize it was that much. It is. And so um, for that reason, um, uh, I would find him a very interesting interview subject, you know, for the magazine. Sure. So we did an interview with him for that. Playboy reached out to you and said, do you want to interview him or did you know him? No, no. Nobody ever reaches out to me. I come up with all these ideas and then I reach out to them. Okay, cool. No, they don't come to me. Um, most Nowadays in journalism, most of the ideas seem to be generated by, you know, the writer. Sure. Sometimes if you work for an organization full time, which I don't, then you get assignments. Right. But as a freelancer, you tend to be more in the idea business now. So do you just work out of a home office or? I have a separate office here at home. Oh, okay. No, that makes sense. Okay. I actually have two apartments connected. And one of them is an office. So um, when the day's over, it doesn't take me long to get home, does it? To be fair, I've never been to New York City. I've been wanting to go for forever. Oh, you should come and visit. Oh, oh, I want to go so bad. You have no idea. The the goal is probably within the next year to get down there because I even have a couple buddies out there. So I guess... We're we're kind of uh, getting close to the end of this, and I, you know I want to respect your time, but I am curious if there's any other advice that you could give aspiring writers what to do, what not to do. If you have any advice for people, well, I think it's important to first figure out what it is you're most interested in. Um, work backwards. Uh, start with what really interests you. For example, if you're passionate about politics and you really want to write about politics then there are lots of um you know websites out there and magazines and that cover politics one of the quickest ways to um uh, get an assignment is go to your local newspaper or a local magazine with an idea and uh, approach them about something that you know that they might be interested in would you go physically down there or even do you think like email uh, works well Going physically down there is a bold move. Uh, (laughs) If you have enough self-confidence and can do it, uh, I wouldn't rule it out. But nowadays it seems as if people um, are relying a lot, um, obviously, on email. Sure. Um, But if you don't have any credits even, um, you can find some radio show that's local and you can tell them, listen, I can get a great interview with um, so-and-so. I'm just using politics as one example. Sure. Or if you're interested in, you know, um, rap music, um, uh, th- there's ways to get into things. You have to first make an idea about what it is you're most interested in. And then secondly, you know, I think systematically you have to make a list of every possible outlet that could be possibly interested in what you're interested in doing. Um, I mean, I used to just call up magazines and newspapers 
and introduce myself using my book credit and, um, you know, pitch ideas. But nowadays it's even easier in a way because with email and websites, um, the entire world is at your door. I've reached out to a lot of the people that have uh, agreed to be guests on the show, like yourself, is I reached out on social media, like LinkedIn, Twitter, Twitter can even be a very casual where, you know, you have like 140 characters to basically say, like what you're doing, you want to be on the show. And then if they're interested, they write back and you kind of, ex- then you start exchanging email, you know, and then you start connecting on social media where I think LinkedIn's a little bit more formal, at least for me. And sometimes I want that. And sometimes I want it to be a little bit more informal, right? So I kind of try to pick a medium to reach out to people based on kind of almost what I'm looking for or kind of maybe even the type of person they are or where I find them most active? I mean, you write articles um, for Tech Zulu, right? Yeah, out of L.A., yeah. And you also, uh, your field is, you know, I guess computer design and um, uh, is it? Uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm a creative director at a software company up in Canada. So, you know, I yeah. have to reach out to people outside of, the city I live in, like the city I live in is about a million people, you know, on the grand scheme of things, it's, it's pretty small. It's not really a big tech hub, but through, through the radio show and through my writing at tech Zulu and you know, just my networking on social media, you know, I've been able to reach out to people kind of similar to what you basically you've described throughout the whole show. You come up with an idea, you want to make it happen. You try to figure out who you need to get in contact with until basically happen. I think the other thing too is there's been people I've reached out to that you don't hear back from that don't or write back like they're not interested. I think rejection is kind of part of the whole struggle of getting kind of what you want at the end of the day. Yes, there's a certain amount of rejection that does happen. And um, I guess you have to just develop kind of a thick skin. Well, we had a, had a good time today. I hope... Uh, I said all the right things. I thought the story about, you know, going from music to writing was a good one. No, totally. It was awesome. I This is going to be a great show. So uh, thanks very much for doing it. It was great. And we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. If you're going to be in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, February 16th and 17th at the Startup Expo and want to meet up and record a show, reach out to me at buildingthefutureshow.com or on Twitter at Building Show. The music for the show is provided by Electric Mantra. Check them out at electricmantra.com. Until next week.